Good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome to On Number Three. This is That's right. This is a pre-recorded uh, episode. <laughs> I'm laughing because I actually thought I had pre-recorded this episode, but it turns out that I did the whole thing and did not press the record button. <laughs> so now I have to do it all over. But I don't mind because it will just reinfor reinforce the word in my heart. Hallelujah. <laughs> Sometimes we have to laugh at ourselves, eh? All right, so when we come back, we look at the seven enemies of our success. Uh, and welcome again to Under Matree. Okay, so here we go again. <laughs> All right, so there are seven enemies to our good success that was described in Deuteronomy 7. And I'm not going to do my usual thing of reading the scripture first. I'm going to go right into the teaching. And at the end, I will go into the scripture because it covers basically what I will, what I will teach on that particular part of the lesson. So without further ado, let's jump right in. <laughs> Okay, so Deuteronomy 7 talks about the seven enemies of our success. Who are the enemies of our good success? In verse 1, they are identified as the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites or Hivites, and the Jebusites. When we are faced with fear, the enemies of our good success, sorry, when we are faced with the enemies of our good success, our first and natural reaction is fear. We see them as stronger than we are, more than we are, and therefore we do not step into the promises of God because of fear. Now, if you haven't seen it yet, I invite you to look at episode 19 and 20, the previous episodes leading up to this, which talk about stepping into your promise and how fear can cause you to go through unnecessary things. All right, so often when we are faced with a situation going into a new venture we are beset with fear can i really do this am i really qualified to do this um what if i fail and believe it or not there are some people who are afraid of succeeding <laughs> hallelujah so let's look at the hittites first the the definitions for these names were taken from aberimpublications.com uh, they're one of my go-to sources when I want a definition of a Hebrew name or a Hebrew word. I find them to be very reliable. Another one is ancienthebrew.org because I like getting into the root of a word to see what it means. Okay, so let's go back. So the Hittites, Hittite means terrible and fearsome. So usually when we are facing a situation that we have never confronted before, we react in fear. The enemy that we see as terrible and fearsome causes us to delay in stepping out. Remember that on the 12th day after leaving Mount Sinai, the Israelites should have been ready to take the land, but they ended up walking in the wilderness for 40 years because their fear led to disobedience. And for those who have who subscribe to this channel and who listen to my uh, broadcast, you will remember that I often say it. Uh, Experiencing fear is not the sin. It is coming into agreement and coming into obedience to fear. Now, remember, if we do that, we are actually sinning because God says he did not give us a spirit of fear, okay, but of power, love, and a sound and disciplined mind. 
Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Psalm 34 verse 4 says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. And Psalm 56 verse 3, my personal favorite, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Listen, it's all about trusting God. Okay. So let's say, and, and sorry, John 1 John 4 verse 18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And this also talks about our relationship with God. If we continue to see God as that fearsome being who's just waiting for us to mess up so that he can punish us, we have not been perfected in our love of God. So what we need to do is see him for he is trustworthy. He answers you. He delivers you. He promises you, fear not, I am with you. <laughs> as a matter of fact, let me rephrase it. He says, fear not for, or you can say, because I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now listen to me. If you feel weak in a situation, he will strengthen you. If you feel helpless in a situation, he will help you. If you feel as if you're going to fall, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Why? Because he is your God. Hallelujah. Shout a hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right. Now, the Gergeshites. So, once you have overcome the fear of the fearsome one, the Hittites, now we have to face the thief. Gergeshite means to drag away, take and stroke the thief who fondles his loot. You might want to ask, how does that really apply now? But let me just get into it. God always wants to bless us. But as we are reminded in previous scriptures and scriptures that we read, blessings attract the attention of the thief also. In Ecclesiastes, we are told that the, the oil in the apothecary, the fly in the ointment. In other words, it, the oil is sweet and so the fly will come. But if you fly it in the ointment, it spoils the oil. Okay? I'm just paraphrasing that. In Genesis 15, verse 10, as Abraham was placing his offerings on the altar, the offering attracted birds of prey. He had to chase them off. And the same way, our blessings will attract people who envy us and imagine our blessings to be theirs and they'll go as far to use as using witchcraft against us to acquire what God has given us. Now, I want you to understand witchcraft is not just hocus pocus, you know, spell chanting and whatever. Witchcraft is, is the, the word for witchcraft in Hebrew actually means manipulation. So there are people who will manipulate you out of what God has given you. And if you are not discerning and wise, this is where you need to seek wisdom. If you are not discerning and wise, you will give it up to them. I remember I had an incident once where I was at a conference and an anointing, I just remember this, an anointing came over me and I was on fire. Literally, I could feel myself on fire, not burning, you know, but just like I could see flames coming off my hands and it was just something else. And, and this woman comes up to me and she said, I'm taking some of those. And, and I almost said, yes, you know, and I said, no, get it for yourself. And I moved away from her because she wanted to put her, no, she must press in and get for herself. So you have people who want your gift just so they can have it and say, oh, this is my gift. This is my gift. I got this from this person, but they never do anything with it. I mean, it would be bad enough if they were going to do something with it, but half of the time they just want to hug it up, fondle it and stroke it and say, yes, I got this but they do nothing with it because it's really not theirs to do anything with. John 10 verse 10 says, a thief comes only to kill, steal and destroy. Sorry, steal, kill and destroy. And I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. First Corinthians 16 says, stay alert, stand firm in the faith, show courage and be strong. Hallelujah. Having overcome them, the next one you're going to come across are the Amorites, the talkers and planners. That's the definition of their, of their name. 
this enemy is one of the most dangerous. They are the one who speak word curses over your gifts, your destiny, your purpose. These persons are usually in authority. Parents, school, teachers, apostles, prophets, pastors. But the most surprising Amorite is guess who? Ourselves. We have a tendency because of lack of faith and lack of knowledge, we speak negative words over ourselves, our destiny, and any gift that God wants to give us. Sometimes we speak it over our health. Oh, that cake is to die for. Next thing you wonder why you have diabetes. Because you said over yourself so many times that it must come to pass. Two things I want to share with you here. I remember a quotation by Dr. Cindy Trim. She said, when we speak, there are two beings, two types of beings listening to what we speak to put it into action. Uh, and obviously I'm not quoting her word for word, I'm paraphrasing. She says, there are demons that listen for what you say that is not the word of God so that they can manifest it. And there are angels listening for the word of God to activate it. And this is verified in Psalm 103 verse 20. And we will say, I remember something that I used to do. The second thing I wanted to share is that um, I remember I love chicken soup, but I will, I don't eat just any place, but there are places that I like to eat at. And a friend of mine, Susie, she does this great chicken soup on a Wednesday. And I remember once I was far away, I couldn't get to her to have lunch. And I went, oh, what I wouldn't give for some chicken soup. Or I would say something like my kingdom for some chicken soup. Or my kingdom for, and, and the Lord just said to me, is your name Esau? And I went, oh my God, because this man signed away his birthright for a bowl of soup, you know? So I had to repent of those words. And I said, Lord, everywhere that I've given my kingdom for a bowl of soup, in the name of Jesus, I call it back, right? Because I'm not giving up my birthright for a bowl of soup. I'm not Esau. Hallelujah. So when we think ourselves unworthy, and we are ready to give up at the slightest challenge. We doubt the power and willingness of God to do what he says he will do. We're willing to say.